Hey everyone, welcome back to I'm Ready to Film Snob, where we review films of today and yesteryear. So in this video, we're going to review the recent theatrical release, Bardo, False Chronicle of a Handful of Truths by Alejandro González Iñárritu. Here we go, let's do it. Alejandro González Iñárritu returns to form, turning his intense filmmaking vision, this time inward, towards himself and his private life. Bardo is an autobiographical filmic confession of insecurities, doubts, and failures cloaked in visual metaphors and surrealistic images that perfectly encapsulate the fragile mental state of an artist struggling to balance a mixed bag of personal feelings. Inyaritu is not afraid to demystify his own fame and perceived importance, bravely turning a critical eye not only towards himself and his career, but also on his family dynamics. Now, all the while, the film simultaneously layers this personal inner struggle with broader and far-reaching themes of colonialism, immigration, national identity, and artistic expression as well as the pervasive shadow that looms over someone who has seemingly reached the pinnacle of their career. The word bardo stems from a Buddhist school of thought, referring to an intermediate, transitional, or liminal state between death and rebirth. And this is the space the film occupies visually and metaphorically. It is a blend of dream state, fantasies, memories, imagination, and also sad realities that merge into a singular vision. Now this film is an ode and a love letter to Mexico that also acknowledges the country's limitations and social latencies. This is a multi-layered onion of a film in which you pull back a layer only to expose an even deeper and more complex layer that at its core has a filmmaker struggling to find himself through his craft. Now, before we get into the premise, first, let me start off by saying you do not have to be Mexican or know anything about Inyaritu's personal life to understand the film. Having a bit of knowledge into these two subjects will help you appreciate some of the nuances but they are not integral to unraveling the meaning of the film. The film is layered with enough issues that there should be some proverbial meat to cling on to somewhere that will allow most viewers to identify with the film at some level. The ride is intricate and richly layered, and the running time is a little on the long side of 2 hours and 45 minutes, but amazingly, in the end, you're left wanting more. Iñárritu has cast Daniel Jiménez Cacho as Silverio Gama, a surrogate for himself. Cacho is great at capturing the jaded reality of a man grown cynical to the world, who is also trying to navigate the complexities of his family dynamics, most prominently between him and his wife and him and his children. The film follows Silvio, a journalist turned documentarian, while he floats back and forth between Mexico and LA, while facing pressures and scrutiny on both sides of the border. Silvio's return to Mexico to receive an award is bittersweet since he has been away and living in LA for so long. He begins to have an existential crisis of sorts as he tries to balance larger issues. Has he changed? Has his native country changed? And most importantly, where does he truly belong? Now, as usual with Inyaritu, his understanding of filmic language and his technical prowess are through the roof on this one. It's all backed by cinematography from Darius Kanji. The film is a visual treat that uses every technique in the filmmaker's book to tiptoe between harsh reality and augmented fantasies. There are great uses of wide angle lenses filling the frame with amazingly choreographed block scenes and intricate set pieces. The camera glides effortlessly through scenes while still keeping us engaged with the actor's performances. Special effects are used to great effects, sometimes subtly, like to hide an edit or cut within a scene, like he did in Birdman, or eliminate the camera being reflected in shots where mirrors are present. Yeah, it's very subtle stuff where, you know, there's a scene where he's in a dressing room getting makeup done and unless you're paying attention and you don't you know you have to realize there should be a camera in that reflection but it's been digitally removed yeah so it's done very subtly and that's the film has a lot of those little moments yet more often the film uses special effects to bring to life the crazy imaginings of a director using film to its full potential oh yeah instances like when Silverio is made small with a child's body evoking childhood memories while still retaining his adult and large head so he looks almost like a bobblehead. Right. Half man, half child, highlighting his half state between memories of past and his current mental state. Now the use of special effects continues throughout, but there's also a scene where a pile of indigenous corpses are stacked in the middle of Mexico City's Socalo Square. And Severio climbs through the dead bodies to the top to have a conversation with, of all people, Hernán Cortés, the conquistador who brought indigenous Mexicans under Spanish rule and caused the fall of the Aztec Empire. Mm -hmm. At the bottom of this pile lies a toppled Aztec deity made of stone that even though it is broken and fractured, still breathes a breath of life. Now these scenes evoke a sense of magic realism that is pervasive in Latin American schools of literature and film. So speaking of magic realism, I loved that scene at the award ceremony that he's not physically present, 
but he somehow is there transcendentally and uh, we see this old lady hammering nails into his feet and no one can see him and he's screaming at the top of his lungs but no sound comes out yeah, yeah. yeah it's it, the film uses that you know magic realism element throughout D different things and it, that's why it uses special effects to bring these to life. You're right. Now even though the film has these great visual flares that are stunning to look at, the film also succeeds in the quieter scenes where the actors just play off of each other and there's no flashy tricks or camera movements. Off the top of our heads, there are two particular scenes that come to mind that are just expertly crafted in their line delivery, acting, and blocking. Now the first of these expertly crafted scenes is an intimate breakfast where Severio and his son are discussing Mexican culture, their life, and their choice to live in LA instead of Mexico. Now this scene is the microcosm of the entire movie, one of the best in the entire film, and Iñárritu dumps what I'm sure is his own unfiltered reality into this moment. Severio's son recognizes that they're no longer Mexican in the true sense of the word, mm -hmm. and choosing a more privileged life in the US has sheltered them from their Mexican identity. Yeah. And he's questioning them. He's like, why did we do this? And that scene culminates with the son angrily walking away, and Silverio's wife lets him know he can't have it both ways. He can't illustrate Mexican greatness while living comfortably in the US. Her dialogue is razor sharp, and she says something along the lines of when someone tries to defend Mexico, Silverio has to remind them of all the unfortunate inequalities and injustices that permeate the culture. But when a gringo talks bad about Mexico, he expounds on how Mexico is a cultural, architectural, and gastronomic wonder and delight. Now Silverio, like Iñárritu, is split, belonging to a fractured nationality, sharing the sentiment of many Latin Americans who are still proud of their background, but quietly acknowledge life in America is better than their harsh reality of their homeland. Now the second of these intimate scenes is a scene that takes place at a rooftop of a party that is being thrown in Silverio's honor in Mexico. And he's confronted by an ex-friend and colleague from TV, Luis, who is now his rival and secretly envies his success. They verbally rip into each other and Luis brings up every negative perception that he has about his films, the film within the film, and the actual fourth wall of the film we're watching. He even details moments that we only see later on in the film and details them saying, oh, well, this you know, part was pretentious or pedantic. And he references scenes that we only see later on in the actual film. Right. So like, I believe this shot of that. Oh, what well, he says, yeah, yeah he says, uh, you know, how could you, your, your ego is so big to have put yourself in a conversation with Hernan Cortez. Right. And that scene only comes much later in the film. Exactly. We don't even notice it. But he calls it out before we even see it, which is, again, elucidating to his critics in a way so yeah and no and the dynamic between them is just oh my. so electric yeah. yeah the two actors really shine in that moment for sure and with this scene Iñárritu is already reveling in the negative reviews he will get for this very film he knows the critiques are coming and addresses them head on calling his own work narcissistic oniric boring and stemming from the mind of someone desperately trying to come off as an artiste. It's as if he disarms his critics with their very own ammunition before they can dish out the negativity. And in a way, Iñárritu already has them figured out. Now, even though Iñárritu preemptively hits back at his own critics, and in essence, the film within a film for being oniric and self-indulgent, the film does incorporate and aptly throws into the mix scenes that cover a larger societal commentary. So the movie's not just about Silverio and in essence, Iñárritu. Right. There are layers of social dynamics that are thrown in there within the layers to make the film more far reaching. Now we want to briefly cover four of these and why they're important because they do cover a gamut of particularly Mexican issues that only a Mexican filmmaker could justly tackle. Immigration, the drug cartel, the subliminal racism of class and ethnicity that exists in the country, yeah. and the new forms of colonialism that are still present today. First, there's an incredible scene that shows a film within the film of a documentary Silverio has made about a caravan of Mexican migrants trying to cross the US border. This scene is amazingly shot, and the vast choreography involved is quite impressive yeah. because it is simultaneously beautiful while also heartbreakingly accurate and realistic. The migrants crossing is based on hope for a better life and not much else. This diaspora of necessity is underscored by talks of a virgin appearing and granting people safe passage. Yeah, which shows again in many Latin American cultures this hope, hope, but through religious connotations. You know, yeah. there's always a virgin or some sort of saint, saint that comes yeah. and will help people 
get, get to where through. They get through their hardships or where they need to go. Yeah. So, I mean, the movie tackles that very well. Mm -hmm. Now, second, covering these larger issues, is another scene of a film within the film in which Silverio is interviewing a narco drug dealer in jail. Oh, yeah. An El Chapo type of character. Now, the scene basically consists of the drug dealer spewing how unprepared the privileged have become at coping with their violence, brutality, and the harsh reality of the underprivileged who have become marginalized and their forced rise to power. He proudly proclaims they have the country by the balls. Basically. Again, Iñárritu is not shying away from uncomfortable topics and issues from his home country, and even though he has been an outsider for many years, his understanding of the, how these issues have marked his people has not faded. Then, there's a third scene in which Silveo and his family and extended family have been invited to stay at the lavish house of a rich friend and likewise the use of a clubhouse and their amenities. Silverio goes to the clubhouse to use the pool and is soon followed by his daughter and the family's maid, who has accompanied them on their trip. Then, as their daughter and maid approach the entrance of the clubhouse, the maid is prohibited from entering because the clubhouse rules do not allow servants to interact with the elite members. Silverio's daughter is understandably upset because she doesn't view the maid as the servant, but as a member of the family. This racial social ladder is present yet socially swept under the rug in Mexico and many Latin American countries as well. It is not simply a matter of wealth or money, but of ethnic hierarchy in which the whiter and more mestizo members tend to have a better social status when compared to the darker and more indigenous lower class. Now these are the ugly truths that few filmmakers wish to bring to the forefront when talking about their own country. But Iñárritu pulls no punches in confronting this. Yeah. Lastly, there's a very subtle and minimal subplot running throughout the entire film about possible news that Amazon, the American corporate entity, is in talks of purchasing all of Baja California and absorb it, reportedly for an obscene amount of money. Yeah. Yeah. You hear it on the news. On the, yeah, on the radio. Yeah. And it, it keeps being subtly mentioned throughout the movie. Very mm -hmm. under the radar, but it's there, yeah. Yeah. Now, while this is obviously a darkly comic and tongue-in-cheek commentary on the pressure Mexico faces from its northern neighbor, it also reflects a deeper insecurity of a returning colonialism, not through force or violence like in the days of the conquistadors, but through money and financial supremacy. Yeah, it's a Mexican filmmaker questioning his country's stance in the world and the overreaching power these massive corporate entities can have on the poor in third world countries. Now, whenever a film like this comes out, I hate that immediately some critics spring up to decry self-indulgence, narcissism, and pretentious filmmaking. Mm -hmm. But I think most of the time, these accusations of self-indulgence are simply incorrect or nearsighted. Now, Iñárritu is following in a rich tradition of talented filmmakers who have reached a peak in their career, and in that career have covered a vast array of themes and topics. And at that peak, the next logical step for them is to look inward. Now, from Federico Fellini in Eight and a Half in Roma, to Bob Fosse's All That Jazz, to Terrence Malick in Tree of Life and Knight of Cups, to fellow Mexican compatriot Alfonso Cuaron with Roma. Now, it is not that these filmmakers have run creatively dry of ideas or don't have other stories to tell, but it's that their stories encompass a reach for a greater understanding of human emotion by tapping into the real experiences that are both arduous and joyous. Their life becomes, in a way, the best kind of ghost screenwriter who yeah. can capture all the intricacies we often record in our mind, yet also stash away, even though they shape who we are. Now, we didn't focus much on the acting, but suffice it to say, all of the actors were great, down to the smallest character and even extras. Aside from Chaco in the main role, Griselda Siciliani, playing Silverio's wife, Lucia, delivers a great performance, showing unwavering devotion while still being able to stand up to her husband when needed. She has a very strong supporting role. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. I also have to mention a standout and masterful performance from Francisco Rubio playing Luis, Silverio's ex-TV host colleague and antagonistic competitor, whose seething envy and arrogant personality are brought to life with an assured performance. Yeah, he played that part perfect. Perfect. Aside from the previously mentioned Buddhist meaning, bardo also means bard in Spanish, a poet or storyteller who would recite epic tales of heroes and their deeds. And this duality of language is also what Iñárritu is referring to in his film. He's acknowledging his own self-indulgent telling of a story about his life, but what separates him is that he's not doing it as a way to bring the spotlight on himself, but it's a way to process his built-up emotions in the only way he knows how to. In a way, it's a spiritual cleanse, not meant to appease critics or a larger audience. He's an artist like many others that only know how to deal with their grief and insecurities by putting those insecurities in their work. And while it seems counterintuitive to make a film just for oneself, there's enough threads that stem from this yarn that keep us engaged and emotionally involved. Yeah, some people might say, why, who cares about his life and why make a, 
how narcissistic to make a movie about your own, your own life. But I mean, let's see if they say that about the Fablemans or other things, because it's, it's that search. That's the only way some artists know how to process right. this stuff is through their work. And that way, that might be some cathartic process for him to kind of let all his built up stuff put poured out to the screen so that others may identify with it. Yeah. I don't think it's narcissistic. Winning two best director Oscars from back to back films is a tall order. And Iñárritu clearly felt the pressure of being a Mexican filmmaker, but not making a film solely about Mexico since his debut feature, Amores Perros, 22 years ago. This is his reply to his peers, his detractors, his critics, his native land, but most importantly to himself about whether he's still a Mexican director yeah. or whether he has sold his soul to the American movie machine. And I think the movie is a masterpiece that is being poorly understood and is not gaining a larger audience because you know, it's being kind of cornered into this thing like, oh, it's just about, you know, the self-indulgent. Right, narcissist. a really long movie about himself. Yeah, yeah no. it's not about that. I mean, that it is about that, but through with much deeper layers. So. Yeah. This will be a strong contender for this year's best for me. Now, I know you already said it was a masterpiece, but as far as ratings, what would you give it? I'd probably give it a 9 out of 10. I think it's a very strong work, one of his strongest. And this is coming from a director who, for many people, is hit or miss. For me, he's always been pretty hit. Um, his films have been very visually strong, thematically strong. Compelling. And I think it's up there with one of his best. And I think when a director puts so much of himself into a film, it can only be genuine and real. Mm -hmm. There's no contritions here. There's no, you know... BSing or having to make compromises. I think I admire that a uh, company like Netflix gave him the money to make this very, very personal film. But well, what makes him smart is that he layers this personal film with all these social and, you know, bigger themes that he th throws in there subliminally. Not subliminally, sometimes not so subliminally. So, yeah. Yeah. How about yourself? What would you rate it? I think, you know, considering the like aside from the subject matter and everything the length of the film it's it's gonna be a little bit challenging for the general audience um i'd probably give it an 8.5 only because it is so long i understand the length i understand yeah. the running time but it may be challenging for today's audience yeah i mean try to watch it on the big screen if you can but if not give it a shot when it does come out on I Yeah, think. it should be coming out on Netflix on December 16th. So be sure to watch it and please let us know your comments down below. We would love to know your input. Cause it's a, it was a little sad when we went to the theater, we were the only ones there. I don't yeah. know if that's a South Florida thing, but we, we talked to a fellow friend in New York and we asked, hey, when you, did you go see Bardo? And he said, yeah, I was the only one in the theater as well. I'm like- Yeah, so that was a little bit disappointing and alarming. So, Cause you know, we need more of these films to be made. Yeah, I mean, Netflix has taken, continuously taking uh, risk with these filmmakers and I think hopefully it pays off for them because this yeah. is a very strong film. Yeah. yeah, so the film, again, is good with, it's not just national identity, it's also about being an artist. Yeah. And that dichotomy of people hating you, people loving you. How to still, in the midst of being this great auteur and artist, be a father and yeah. a husband. Yeah. And all these great, I mean, there's also a lot of layered things that are clearly personal. I mean, there's a interesting scene where it's kind of a reverse birth. Right. That That's another scene that why I gave it that rating. It may be a little bit off-putting because it does happen at the very beginning of the film. Yeah. It's so. like, get ready for this ride. Because that's the thing about the film. It's like, there's a layer and then right beneath it, there's another layer. Yeah. And, there's another, and then you mix personal layer with social layer. And, you know, all these little moments that are clearly from his life mm -hmm. with these grander themes that are sometimes a little over the top or ridiculous, but they all play into each other. Yeah. Go out there and watch it. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss more Film Snob Reviews.